volcano to seismicity, earthquakes, uh, crustal deformation, and then a little bit also eruptions. But, um, and I will obviously today introduce, it's more introductory, so I will explain exactly what volcanoes are. Also because um, now you, some of you said about this, some of you didn't. Um, some of you are already in geophysics programs from before, and, but my experience from uh, the ICTP students is that sometimes they come from different topics like uh, material science, or uh, different topics of physics. So it will take a little bit before you, um, uh, you basically enter into this world of the volcanoes. I hope it will, I will, it will, uh, you will like it. I hope you will like it. So I will start by sharing some slides and then uh, uh, in the slides today, there will be many movies. So I will, uh, basically there will be links to some YouTube movies because I would like you to know what I'm talking about. So therefore uh, we will, um, um, have a look at the phenomena that occur in volcanoes. So mostly they are eruptive phenomena because the Obviously, what happens in the Earth is not possible to see, but what uh, happens after that, when the volcano erupts, then we can see it in, in, uh, on YouTube as movies. And uh, th so this is, I'm going to show you this. Anyway, so now I'm going to share my slides. Um, Okay. So first of all, I will um, introduce uh, myself. Um, so before I before I go to the slide, I'll go first to introduce myself. So my name is Eleonora. This name here, Rivalta, my last name. And I am Italian, but I, I am uh, now based uh, in Germany. I am based at the, this institute, Geo, Geo, German Research Center for Geosciences called the GFZ or GFZ. Um, I am also based at the University of Bologna in Italy, but I currently physically, as I mean, where I am, I am in Germany. Um, I am, yeah, I, I am a physicist as well. So I, my degree was in physics in Bologna. And uh, uh, during my degree and uh, during my PhD, I had a thesis on uh, in geophysics, uh, studying dislocations. So therefore uh, dislocations applied both to volcanoes and also to earthquakes. And then after that, I went for a lot of um, postdoctoral positions in many countries. So I decided to move. Uh, I went first to Germany to have a postdoc. Then after that, uh, I, I went to Italy. Then I went to the US, to Stanford in California. Then I went to England. And when I went to England, I was a lecturer for three years at the University of Leeds. Uh, and after moving so much, I decided to go back to Germany and uh, start um, uh, a research group. So I received some, quite some big funding and I started to hire people and to have my, my students, my own students. That happened more or less 10 years ago. And uh, since then I have my um, research group Currently, it's uh, seven people. Um, they are a mix of postdocs, PhD students, and I also have uh, um, a, a student who is just uh, recently graduated and uh, um, she's applying for a PhD. 
um, and they all uh, work on different topics that are related to volcanoes. Uh, they do numerical modeling, they do analytical modeling. Um, we will talk a little bit about what my students do because I will show you some of the things they do um, over the course. Um, so this is just to introduce myself. <laughs> um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, you will ask me, but for first we can start a little bit and talk about the volcanoes. Then we can also, you, you can have uh, questions later. Okay, so let me go to the slide. So, so first of all, um, I have a slide on why it's important. And here there are, uh, it's very summarized. There are uh, four points, but um, they are very uh, uh, summarized because actually the reasons are many. So first of all, here I um, highlighted two words. One is magmatism and one is volcanism. These two have two different meanings. Magmatism is uh, considered uh, uh, anything that involves the migration of magma in the lithosphere, uh, in the Earth's crust. But so it can be anything, but still the magma not necessarily has erupted. When we talk about volcanism, like here, volcanism, this means uh, it has erupted. So it's a surface process. Volcanism is a surface process on, on the surface of the Earth, while magmatism is more a lithospheric process. So the first point is about how they um, contribute to shaping the surface of the Earth and the interior of the Earth, and how they affect many, many processes, tectonic and small scale, uh, processes that occur fast and processes that occur very, very uh, slowly. Um, these are many, many processes. We will talk about them a little bit. Then of the two volcanism, so when eruptions happen, they come with many, uh, volcanism comes with many hazards and these hazards endanger the local, co the local communities. Um, even there exists is a very remote possibility, but there exists even a possibility for an eruption large enough to endanger humanity as a whole. Um, so therefore, so this is minor and we, we will not focus on this, on the big, big, super big eruptions. We will talk a little bit about them, but mostly uh, there are other hazards like lava flows uh, and pyroclastic flows. We will see some, some uh, footage from this hazard. So you know what I'm about. So this is another reason why it's important to study magmatism and volcanism because we want to understand these hazards and if possible, even forecast them. Then volcanism also is uh, one of the few natural phenomena that have the potential to affect climate. Indeed, indeed uh, big eruptions in the past have affected climate on short, medium and even longer time scales. So also the uh, interaction with climates are very interesting. I will not uh, go into this, but it is a very important topic as well. And then finally, uh, magmatism and volcanism enrich the Earth's crust and surface with their minerals and support the livelihood around the globe. So there are many resources that are brought to, to us from the volcanoes. Uh, and uh, it is uh, interesting to know how these resources accumulate, how they um, also heat, because heat is a very big resource, especially nowadays when we need alternative source of energy. Uh, they also have a relation with oil, they have a relation with um, mining, uh, so it's good to know. And it, if we understand the magmatism and volcanism, then we have a better chance to use these resources in a better way. So obviously my course will not be very applied. It will be more theoretical as you probably are used to from other teachers, but I will try to show you all these links as we uh, go on and talk. If you have any questions, please, um, uh, you can also interrupt me and, and ask the question. 
Okay, so we will go over a little bit of definitions uh, today and also get a feeling for the diversity of volcanism on Earth because it's a very diverse uh, business. We have a lot of different types of volcanoes, eruptions and styles and shapes and uh, also related hazards. And we will understand, uh, start to understand how all this diversity comes from the specific tectonic environment top down. So how the tectonic environments and tectonic forces uh, influence this type of volcanism, but also the magma composition. So how magma, when it's formed um, at depth from melting, uh, the type of magma that we have is going to influence also the style. And also we will talk about famous volcanoes on our planet and learn a little bit of, uh, of these famous volcanoes. Uh, okay, so first of all, to just the word volcano has a couple of definitions. So um, generally, uh, it, it's not that easy to define a volcano because there are many definitions. Here there is one, like an opening. The opening is called a vent from on the surface of the earth or also another planet. Um, through which molten rock, uh, solid rock fragments, hot vapor and gases erupt. So we have uh, a mixture of uh, all phases, <coughs> solid uh, melt um, and uh, gas phase. Um, so a volcano can just be a crack in the ground according to this definition. Um, or it can be also a volcanic field where we have many of these vents. Uh, according to definition number two is a more defini uh, definition that is more uh, yeah, for uh, the population like this. It's like a co usually conic shaped mountain formed by the position of volcanic materials. However, this def definition could be confusing because uh, some volcanoes are not conic shaped mountains. We will see that there are types of volcanoes that don't look like that at all. Uh, then in yellow here, we find some uh, rough information to have an idea how much, uh, how many volcanoes are active and uh, how much they erupt. So we have that um, in the last 10,000 years, we consider that around uh, 1500 volcanoes were active. Why do I write 10,000 years? Because 10,000 years is considered a time scale that if a volcano has not erupted since, it will probably be um, uh, extinct, extinct. So the volcano, um, 10,000 years is the time scales that the volcanoes that erupt least frequently, more or less at least every 10,000 years they erupt. However, this definition, this uh, 10,000 years, although it's very, very used, it can also be confusing because uh, evidence is emerging that actually 10,000 years is a bit short of a time scale because there are areas on the planet that have erupted 12,000 years ago, for example, and uh, still they appear quite active yet. And therefore, this is not really clear. It's not a sharp boundary, although it is used as a number. Okay, then every year we have around 50 volcanoes in average to erupt. And at any given time, we generally in average, we have around 20 volcanoes erupting. Um, we will talk about the specific volcanoes later on. Okay, then we have some other definitions. So when we talk about magma, what is that? It's molten rock, but it is a mixture with crystals and gas. And we talk, this is uh, confuses a lot of people that are not used to, to vol volcano science. We talk generally about magma when it still is below the earth's surface. It has not erupted yet. While we talk about lava, when it is erupted magma. Okay, but then there are two words that we're going to use sometimes. Pyroclast is solid fragments 
ejected from volcanoes. So there are eruptions that uh, already when they are ejected or also when they are still in free fall and they are about to, to fall on the surface, they are really solid uh, stuff. And then we call them pyroclasts. And then tephra is uh, all pyroclasts that fall to the ground from the eruptive column. If we have an eruptive column, then what falls to the ground, this is called tephra. It's a mixture, it looks like a gravel, uh, mostly. Okay, then let's get go over quickly the volcanic hazards. Not all of them we will talk about, we will talk about some. But it is uh, a long list, as you see. So hazards are lava flows, uh, ash, fallout is a big hazard in many areas. We also have fallout of heavy material and they are distinguished ash and uh, heavy material because they have a different uh, way of transport. Um, they are transported in a different way from winds and the atmosphere. Therefore, they are generally um, distinguished. Then we have pyroclastic flows. We will see footage and so you will understand what this is if you don't know yet. We have uh, gas emis emissions that can be toxic. Uh, there are uh, poisonous gases that are sometimes emitted from volcanoes, including sulfur or even more poisonous stuff like phosphorus or, or fluorine or something like this. So it's important to have a look at the composition of the gas emitted by a volcano. Then there are mud flows. Mud flows are very deadly. Um, flows that occur when uh, you have, uh, for example, the eruptive column is very wet. It happens that it contains a lot of water vapor. Or when you have the volcano uh, erupting and melting an ice cap, for example, or there is a drainage of a lake. Anyway, you have an accumulation of mud. Is on the soil in volcano is not very compact, is uh, generally often quite loose. And therefore, if you have an accumulation of hot water or even cold water, sometimes you can generate mud flows. And these mud flows uh, uh, run very fast and they can be very huge and uh, they can be very deadly. So it's a very high hazard at volcanoes. Then we have volcano landslides and the landslides can, can create tsunamis. So volcanoes, as I said, the soil is very loose. It may be very unstable. Uh, and not, uh, yeah, the volcano is not a very solid structure by itself. Uh, and it happens periodically that uh, a flank uh, collapses of an entire volcano, and then you have a tsunami um, potentially if this is an island. Then obviously we also have earthquakes. Obviously we also can have fire. And then we have a last uh, here, the opening of vents. So if you have a city, for example, there are cities, even cities constructed and built over volcanic fields. So in, uh, there is a possibility um, that uh, a vent, like an eruptive crack, opens just uh, in the, literally in the courtyard of, of somebody's house. And we will see also footage from some of these. Okay, so this is just an overview, but we will see some of this. First of all, I want to show you, um, because the, the question often comes, what uh, deadly eruption there have been. Unfortunately, there have been uh, quite a few and uh, with many, many deaths. And uh, you can see from this list, so this is an, an, a list that actually most of the, um, most of the um, victims from volcanoes, they have occurred due to starvation, due to mud flows, due to tsunamis and ash flows. So not, not even so much lava flows. Lava flows, it's uh, like a minor uh, hazard generally. Most of it is uh, things that happens way faster, um, like pyroclastic flows, ash flows and mud flows as well as starvation, but this obviously um, 
uh, hopefully, I mean, even in Iceland, you see there was an eruption in 1783 where people starved because uh, in, in this um, country, uh, if uh, the winters are very long in that particular country, so if you lose your um, the possibility to have food in summer because the volcano uh, doesn't allow the crops to to grow, then then uh, this can be a consequence. So therefore, volcanoes are so uh, entangled with the population that you can have this. And we hope today, actually, this is getting better. So the victims. Uh, of volcanoes are uh, decreasing fast because people and the observatories and the, the competent people are becoming very good in guessing that an eruption is going to come also due to very increased monitoring and uh, knowledge about how the volcanoes work and therefore the deaths are decreasing fast uh, from the statistics. Hopefully this uh, simply continues. Okay, so now we can have a look at these volcanoes where they are. Um, and uh, we can see that they are clustered a little bit. So they come sometimes isolated for some reason. We will explore these reasons partially, um, but uh, most often they come in clusters. And this list here is also not necessarily super complete. But you can see that there are definitely a lot of volcanoes around uh, the Pacific. So this is called the Ring of Fire, as many know. There are a lot of volcanoes in Indonesia. And in general, in uh, this region between uh, Australia and Southeast Asia, it's very full of volcanoes. The west of Americas is uh, full of volcanoes, the, the Aleutian Islands. And then we have a lot also in North Africa and uh, we have in, in Italy as well here. Some are in Europe um, and uh, also in the uh, Middle East in this area. And of, of course also, and this is often forgotten for, for the list of volcanoes. There are a lot, a lot of volcanoes and actually a lot of volcanism on the mid-ocean ridges. And actually this is <coughs> uh, really the vast majority of magma erupted is erupted on mid-ocean ridges. Um, but they are poorly known because they occur below the, below the ocean and uh, there is a still limited knowledge about mid-ocean ridges. They are very interesting, very nice. Okay, so this animation I will not show, but uh, we will talk about this. Uh, this um, oh, maybe we can have a look if they are still working because I'm not sure this this work actually. Okay, sea floor spreading. Uh, okay, this is the mass production plate tectonics. They are gone, these animations here, or maybe they're a good source anyway. So I will go. These are simply animation that were supposed to show you how volcanoes um, are born in the different tectonic environments, but uh, I will show it anyway later. So they are, uh, volcanoes are occur in all uh, tectonic environments in different ways. We will talk about how melt, how magma, is formed in the different tectonic environments. But before we go there, we can have a look at the shape of volcanoes. So there are uh, uh, many shapes that volcanoes can have. They can have, they can be fissures, like crack in the, in the, in the ground, simply. They can be shield volcanoes. They can be stratovolcanoes. Then there are cinder cones, dome volcanoes, and calderas. We will, show some photos. Okay, so this is a fissure eruption. So this is like a fissure, like what I refer to when I say crack in the ground. So uh, they just uh, really open like this. And we will, we will see later why, why this is the case. Um, this happens a lot, actually. You may think it's not so frequent that you have this, 
This is beautiful to be seen in Iceland. And right now, right now, there is one eruption that is exactly like this in Iceland, in the Reykjanes Peninsula. Maybe later we will also see some footage from, from that particular eruption. But it occurs uh, even on, uh, on volcanoes that you have these fissures. Um, so on volcanoes that look like an edifice, you have these fissures. Uh, the volcanoes are erupting from similar fissures. Sometimes the volcanoes don't, don't, don't even, you don't see there is no edifice and you see just a crack in the ground. This, for example, is in Iceland, but you can see it uh, in all the uh, East African rift system in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in a lot of uh, areas there. So, oh, skip too much. So here there are some movies. So this is how it looks like when you have one of these eruptions. You are just uh, standing there and you see all lava fountains, like a curtain of fire um, from the fissure. This, this is how it looks like. Then I'll show you another one from the helicopter. Stop the music. I'll bring the movie. So, okay, the helicopter is approaching, and you see that there is a lot of air coming from the fissure, and the fissure is just simply erupting. This is an eruption to occur the um, years ago and it started like this like a very big fissure a very long fissure and then um, with time it had developed in just uh, just a few uh, cones with eruptions and then in the end just one cone this is uh, how they develop because part of the fissure basically freezes and parts is eroded from the whole magma so it develops one specific cone Okay, so this is a fissure eruption. Then we have um, ah, yeah. This looked like this, but later, and you see that later. It had formed like a very big cone because all the sparkle from the eruption had formed uh, a cone, like a elongated cone from which more magma was there. And later was even more focused. So the fissure was kind of almost disappeared. Here you can see still some residuals of the initial fissure but mostly everything was erupting from just one cone. And you see how fluid is magma, how low viscosity the magma is in this case. Um, and the eruption occurs very gently. You don't have much explosion. You have some gas that comes out with the, with the magma, but you have a lot of, uh, the eruptions are very gentle. And uh, this is called the fusive eruption. Okay. Then let's have a look. Okay, so this eruption, how did it happen? It came actually from a volcano, but erupted in, in an area of low ground. So the volcano looked like this. So we will talk about this one later on again. So the volcano had a magma chamber and the magma chamber was fed from below uh, the melt was ascending and feeding the magma chamber. And then at some point the magma chamber was too full and uh, it uh, uh, created a crack and the magma propagated within the crack and erupted at a fissure um, distant from the volcano, very distant, actually 30, 40 kilometers distant. And we will talk about how this uh, happens but not today. Then we have shield volcanoes. Shield volcanoes look like this. This is Mauna Kea from Wikipedia. This is uh, 
in Hawaii. And they are called the shield volcanoes because they look, they have this shape. Um, so you can see already from their shape that they are also formed from magma that are very low viscosity. The magma flows very freely, the eruptions are gentle, and they don't pile up so much material. Uh, they, it just flows away, it flows down the flank away. So these are shield volcanoes. Low viscosity lava flows, not exclusively, but a lot of that is low viscosity lava flows. So the example is a Y. This is, uh, oops, sorry. This is Mauna Kea, which is uh, the, the volcano, and it's here, Mauna Kea. This uh, island here is the big island of Hawaii. Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it is a chain of Iceland, islands. And this island is the southernmost one. Uh, it has um, five volcanoes, of which I, I think four are considered active. This is Mauna Loa, is a, a giant volcano, so also Mauna Kea. These are the two most giant mountains on the, all, on the whole earth. If you consider from the bottom of the ocean, they are much taller than the Mount Everest than in Tibet, if you consider from the bottom of the ocean. And the other uh, very active volcano is this one called Kilauea that is um, not easy to see. This is the crater, the summit crater of Kilauea. And most of the eruptions occur uh, in this rift. Uh, they have been occurring in this rift in the last 30 years. And you can see that Mauna Loa has a lot of eruptions in the last um, 100, 200 years. OK, so we can have a look at the Kilauea eruption. What happened there? So so the, I'll just move it a slightly away. You see what happens in this eruption? It happened that basically there were cracks here in the ground, but not in the middle of nowhere, like in Iceland. They occurred in the forest, or in the there were also houses. To, to some extent, I see the crack just opens and then lava comes out of the crack. Okay, so this is a fissure eruption in Hawaii. And if we move the video a little bit, so we can see then obviously a lot of lava came out and burned a lot of forest. Wanted to show you later. Again, no, after all, the forest is done because it's all burned. Then the volcano starts to form these cones um, from which it erupts. So part of the fissure freezes, and then uh, a cone is formed. And obviously, there is a lot of destruction because the lava just uh, gets rid of everything that was there below. And as you see also here, the lava is very gentle. There is a lot of gas. It, uh, it is mildly explosive because it erupts in this way. But, and there are also some explosions, but they are not very big. And most of the eruption is uh, gentle and effusive. Um, So then uh, if you wait enough time, then the, oh, no. If you wait enough time, then you have, um, the lava becomes slightly more viscous. And then you see it, con it continues to flow gently out of some vents like this. It either pours down um, it becomes uh, colder on the outer face and continues to flow below because it freezes at the at the top and continues to flow below. So therefore, it can make actually quite many kilometers in this way because it forms a so-called lava chain. 
increases at the top and flows below. Yeah, okay. I don't want to see it. So you could see, and in here, they don't show it so much. But actually, a lot of houses were impacted and a lot of people lost their home because it was uh, simply covered by a lot of lava flow. And this is uh, simply a hazard. And therefore, this is also another reason why it's important to figure out what is the probability that you might have if you live closest to one of these areas, what is the probability that um, if you want to maybe buy a house in the future to choose a location that will not have such a hazard because otherwise, um, yes, you may lose your home. Okay, then I'll show you. Ah, this is another one. Okay, this is gone. Okay, then what other shapes do we have? We have the shape of a stratovolcano. Stratovolcano is called like this. It's called a stratovolcano because it, it is built, um, the edifice is built out of many, many, many eruptions that are um, partially, they can be effusive, par partially they can be mildly explosive or explosive. And this is Mount Fuji, beautiful Mount Fuji in Japan. There are many volcanoes that look with this shape, that have this shape where the summit is slightly steeper than the lower flanks. While shield volcanoes, if you remember, were the opposite. The summit was actually rather flat and uh, the, the flanks were also rather flat, but the summit even flatter. While stratovolcanoes, they are generally a bit steeper around the cone. So, then what is the difference between this eruption? We can have a look at this. It's more footage. So you see this is a, a eruption in, in 2001 and how they look like. They look like, uh, you see that there is more explosive component because there, there are more, um, more gases that are in magma, you see how, maybe you can hear some sound, you can even hear the sound. That's much more explosive than what we saw before. And you see also the formation of an eruptive plume. So you see a gas plume and a, and a ash plume that forms out of the eruption. So it is definitely more explosive. Although it is still, um, I mean, one volcano, Etna, that is considered uh, not to be, to be um, not uh, particularly explosive as behavior. Then we can have a look at this one too. So you see here the lava, how it becomes, uh, is not as uh, liquid, <laughs> or low viscosity as in Hawaii or the fissure eruption in Iceland, it is uh, one step towards more solid. And this is how the lava flow looks like distant from the vent. The vent, you see the lava is still very, very liquid, but then as it flows away a little bit, then it becomes um, much more solid and it fragments in this way, in the way you see. Okay, there are other movies you can have a look if you like. Um, so then we have, uh, yes, we can, we can see that uh, some eruptions are effusive, but they can also travel kilometers and kilometers and therefore they can also build uh, some hazards because they can reach more down the flank and invade some towns or cities. Okay, so this cinder cone here that you see here is basically what is left after one of the eruptions 
that I showed you late before, and then you wait too many years uh, until the vegetation starts to grow again. And uh, then uh, you, you basically see in the field uh, this kind of structure. It's like a cone with an ex with a um, like a crater at the top, uh, and the size can be very different. But I um, mean, this is quite typical. You see here the houses for a scale. This is a typical eruptive cone uh, for an eruption that lasted quite a lot. Okay, then we have dome volcanoes, dome forming volcanoes. Dome forming volcanoes have the lava is very, very, very viscous already at the volcano summit. So it doesn't really flow down very easily in these dome forming volcanoes. The lava is super viscous. So basically what it does is to pile up. It piles up at the summit of the volcano. Um, and then it builds a huge hazard because it's a huge pile of very, very high viscosity stuff that is very unstable. And uh, things can happen to destabilize. For example, if you pile more and more and more, eventually it will collapse. Or you can have other things like, for example, weather or a storm or an earthquake to destabilize this lava dome. So lava domes are enormous um, hazards for uh, populations down the flank of such a volcano, obviously, as you can imagine. Yeah, of these dome forming volcanoes, there are many in Indonesia, there are many in the Caribbean, so it's a more volcanoes that are related to subduction zones. There are many in Japan. Um, and uh, yes, so this, these are uh, among the most dangerous. So we can have uh, some footage from Mount St. Island, which is one famous volcano. It's a time lapse and what we can see the dome the dome growing. You see this kind of ball here growing? We are in the crater of the volcano and you see the lava that comes out of the volcano. And it is very solid lava, you see? This is like, uh, even structures like this are, uh, you know, they, they come out as blocks and then they destroy a little as they come out. So it's really um, quite high viscosity stuff. This is a dome forming volcano. We can have a look at more. A lava dome collapse. Sinabung volcano in Okay, so here you see the dome that is collapsing. Okay. And you see how it generates, all, it first starts as just a few cracks and then simply doesn't hold anymore. And you see that it uh, collapses and generates uh, so much um, gases and uh, ash particles in the, in the atmosphere and then flow uh, together with the more solid material underneath. But I want to show you... Oh, they, I mean, they are very viscous initially, these lavas, super viscous. But as they flow, the viscosity drops dramatically because they, they fluidize. They become um, so, so fast. They run very, very fast. And therefore, it's very, very difficult to run away. time a TV camera in the village records this scene. They are really deadly, deadly flows. 
these pyroclastic flows. Okay, here there is an earthquake shaking our dome. You see what happened? A lot of cracks start, start to happen. And you have a lot of the gassing from all the cracks that form during the, the shaking. So the shaking, um, it's a disaster. And then some collapse starts to cool. This is why also this is one type of something that we will have a look later on during the course, which is the interaction between volcanoes and earthquakes. What happens when we have this interaction? Okay, so I showed you quite a few things. Um, do you have any questions regarding these volcanoes? No questions? Um, okay, we can we can continue, but please, uh, it would be nice also for me if we, even if you come up with, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be a very cool question. We, it, it's uh, a bit nicer if we can chat a bit. Um, anyway, I will go ahead now. Okay, excuse me, Professor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, I have one question. So yeah. um, before um, the event happened, um, it could be detected that um, these events will be happening, the eruption will be happening maybe at this time. And, and um, what um, was the um, method used in maybe collecting such data and processing and getting to know when and how it will have happened? Yes, so uh, this is a very good question. And indeed, we will talk a lot about this. So the main ways volcanoes are monitored uh, is um, there are many ways. But the, let's say the three fundamental are earthquakes, like there is seismic monitoring. And we will see what type of signals. There will be like little earthquakes. There will be weird signals with different frequency, with different, uh, I mean, uh, fancy earthquakes that only occur at volcanoes. Then there is a second method, which is uh, ground, ground displacement. So you have a GPS stations, and if you have INSAR technique to um, monitor whether the volcano is deforming. Because when magma comes up from below, there is some pressure and volume change in the edifice, and therefore the volcano swells. And depending on the pattern of swelling, you can figure out the depth of swelling and uh, how much uh, magma it's on the move and something. And we will go to this. We will uh, really um, have a look at the models that are used to infer uh, the source properties of the swelling. And then the third is the gas. So the gas, there are uh, monitoring um, instruments that measure the, the emissions of the gas. However, as far as I know, the two methods really used to forecast, like to say, okay, the volcano observatory people sit and say, we need to evacuate or we need to, um, to do something, you know, uh, something is going to come up are the earthquakes and the deformation. And it depends uh, which volcano, what, uh, which one of the two methods is uh, more used and more important because some volcanoes tend to deform very little and have a lot of earthquakes. Other volcanoes tend to not have a lot of earthquakes but to deform a lot. So uh, therefore it depends a little bit also on the style, uh, whether the magma is very viscous or very low viscosity. 
and we will talk a lot about this. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. More questions? Yeah. So we saw many examples. Uh, and we saw a lot of examples of uh, volcanic edifices that are built, but also there are examples of volcanic edifices that are destroyed. For example, we can have caldera collapse. We will talk about a uh, collapse and we have uh, mass waste landslides and we have erosion. So these are three processes that uh, may uh, flatten your edifice or creating, um, removing some topography. And this is another cool footage from uh, a caldera collapse. At some beautiful way, a volcano and unmanned aircraft systems so, recently have navigated. This is a uh, caldera that formed. We, we also will see the footage. Where is it? At some point it shows it. Not. But this is the whole caldera. And this whole big hole was formed in just a few weeks. And you can see here the footage of when it's, it was formed. Now let me make it bigger. Just going down and down. So this obviously occurs only if you have uh, something that causes this must be quite big, you know, to have uh, such a collapse, you need to drain the magma chamber from, from the side. So basically the magma chamber is here, it cracks on the side and the magma flows away from the side. We will see how this occurs. And then it drains so much that all the ground above collapses down. Yeah, we will, see, we will see more. So Caldera, this is an example of a Caldera. This is in Italy, it's uh, close to Naples. It's called the Campi Flegrei. And it is a Caldera that has a lot of smaller calderas inside. So each one of all these calderas, the smaller ones, but also the big one, they are the, the scar of one eruption. So the very big one here, was, called, was uh, caused 40,000 years ago, and it created a huge eruption, really huge is one of these super eruptions that occurred in the past. Then after that, there was another one, a bit smaller, maybe something like this, 15,000 years ago, and it's called the Napolitan Yellow Tuff. We will talk shortly about this again uh, in a few slides. And then since 15,000 years ago, we have had many smaller eruptions that, however, they are not so small. This here is the last one and it occurred in 1538. And now there is a full town in these calderas, but we will have a look. Okay, this is a little bit. Um, these are other collapses that occurred, um, but are smaller than the collapse that I showed you before. And here we can see uh, one example of this caldera collapse. It's in Japan um, and the volcanoes, um, after the collapse has occurred, they show some changes in their style. So therefore we see that the caldera collapse is very important. Here are relatively old figures because are from 20 years ago. So the volcano was like this and the magma again was drained sideways and the caldera was formed in this way. So you see in September there uh, uh, in uh, 2000. So, okay, before the collapse, there was nothing. The summit was rather flat. And then in July, it was like this. 22 July was like this and September was like this. So they occur relatively um, quickly and we, we will see more about that later. So this I will skip now, we will talk about it later. I'll just show you this figure. So this figure is, uh, has uh, some geophysical signals and you see a lot in this figure. It's an old one. We will look at also <coughs> newer data coming from the volcanoes. But basically what do you see? Here is this island that had the collapse. 
This is the island. It's like this and the collapse was at the top. You see the GPS, they point towards the center because basically the collapse has uh, deflated the whole volcano. You have the magma chamber was drained, so it shrunk and all the GPS arrows point inward in the volcano. This one particularly much. And here in the, in the earthquakes, you see the magma that was propagating sideways. So the magma chamber cracked sideways. And then the magma went many kilometers sideways. This is around 30, 30 kilometers. The magma propagated laterally, 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 creating a lot of earthquakes, magnitude six, quite big ones. And you see GPS on these other islands, they went apart because the magma was going like a blade like this, and then was splitting basically almost. I mean, here is not, no continental splitting, it's not, nothing of the sort, but still the islands were uh, drifting apart due, during this process. And you see the seismicity was um, through the whole little, through the whole crust. Uh, here the crust is a bit deep. It, the, crust uh, is around 20 kilometers, but most of the crust was split uh, by this magma here. So when we monitor this stuff, we need to more or less understand also the scenario because we see a lot of earthquakes and we need to understand what actually is going on. And I will show you during the next days when we do the classes, I will show you to understand what is going on in these volcanoes? If we see some some of this data, okay, this is the caldera. I will skip this figure. I will show you. So basically, how does the caldera collapse occur? Sometimes it's a very very big magma chamber and shallow, and then everything just goes down almost at once. But if you have a smaller magma chamber and it's a bit deeper, then uh, you see this phenomenon. You know that uh, you form a cavity. And then the roof collapses on top of the cavity and uh, the cavity kind of migrates until you have the final moment and you have the collapse um, of the, the floor of the uh, ground. And then you may have also some explosive eruptions because you also have, for example, some rainwater entering and uh, touching the magma, being trapped, and so on. And then you have also seismicity uh, that shows that you have uh, the collapse, you know, these faults uh, and the whole collapse. We will, this is just uh, today, is just uh, symbolic to show you more or less uh, a lot of things, but in the next days we will go in detail and, and see physically what happens in these cases. Uh, so this is about Campi Flegrei again. Campi Flegrei is this volcano here. It's a caldera, as I said, like big, big eruptions. This one close to Campi Flegrei is Vesuvius. It's a very famous volcano because uh, it created the Pompeii eruption in the year 79, where the town of Pompeii, which is more or less located here, was uh, completely covered by pyroclastic flows. And then here there is another volcano called Ischia. All these volcanoes uh, are rather dangerous, but maybe the most dangerous is Campi Flegrei because you can see the size, how big it is. Also in comparison with Vesuvius and this case, it's very big. The magma chamber is very large. And here is uh, this eruption that I was talking to you about 40,000 years ago is where the explosion went. And you see that it went into central Russia even with uh, one centimeter of the position. Here is uh, like five centimeters, 10 centimeters, you know, how big it was. And uh, so here you had the 50 centimeters uh, or uh, in this area and actually close by several meters. So these are super eruptions and we hope we are not going to see one, but it's uh, interesting to figure out why they occur, why such big eruptions occur. And this is what happens when you have some, uh, one of these big eruptions. So the whole yellow that you see here, 
This is just the volcano uh, pyroclastic flows from one of these eruptions. It, uh, it uh, erupts um, very explosive mixture. Uh, in this case is yellow. It became yellow, the, the product. And it's all one eruption, the whole yellow layer. And this is how the Campi Flegrai Caldera looks today. So how full of people it is, you know, each of these crater was an eruption, one eruption. Here they, there is a horse uh, race track. And this one is empty because it was uh, the, the hunting park for the king back then. So it, it's a park and it's protected also today. But all the rest is full of houses. And these people live on, on a very big volcano. Oh, excuse me, Professor. Yes. Um, so um, this place, no, the slide you just uh -huh, here. There are people still over there. Still ah, yes, they are now. This is from now, this photo. Um, and we said, and previously you said um, the time scale for the event can, it means it can really happen again at the same yes. place. Yes. And since they are there, <laughs> once it happen or like they know the time to happen. So that's why they are still there and they've not moved or evacuated or something. And this is a good question. You know, the fact is that the, this volcano was, uh, um, so this volcano, by the way, is the one with the yellow thing. So the eruption with the yellow layer, which is many meters, even 20 meters, it, it occurred in this volcano um, 15,000 years ago. This volcano, I'll, I'll go to this map, is a bit tricky because if you are there, you don't see the mountain. You know, if you are close to this one, which is Vesuvius, still people live quite close. They live until here. There are photos, actually, I may Google it. So you will see it. Ah. Uh, just to show you how it looks like, this volcano Vesuvius. It's like this, you know, but the side is like this. So this is a photo. Wait, I'll move a bit here to the side. So you see how it is. People still went quite, quite up the flank to live, but not really on the summit because this volcano, people know it's a volcano. They, the last eruption was, nine, so there are two components. One, if you see it, 1944 was the last eruption. During the Second World War, there were the planes from the Americans um, flying and they took footage of the eruption. So there are footage from this eruption in 1944. That was the last one in this volcano. And this is the situation nowadays. And Campi Flegrei, is now like this. So you see how many houses in this volcano. And the last, erup the last eruption was here, a tiny one. Um, no, sorry. I wanted a different map. Well, maybe here, yeah, you know, this one, if it comes. Uh, okay, anyway, so I'll, I have other maps in the future, but this baby here, the baby cone, this is the last one, last eruption. While the big one that created the 20 meters of yellow deposits was this big, you know, but if an eruption this big occurs, um, well, first of all, the probability is, of course, remote. Um, I'm not even sure, you know, even where I am in Germany, where you are in Trieste, it will be covered by this much, you know, ash. It will be huge. 
the whole economy of Italy will be crippled entirely, and even the one of, of Europe entirely, and I would say even the world, because everything is so entangled today that if you have a country failing, you have all the countries failing because all the banks are together and everything. So you, you were asking why they are still living there because it's a tricky volcano. You see, nobody, if you are there, like in the slide, where is the slide? Here, you don't see much mountains. You see a little bit, you know, but there is no mountain. So people are not even aware that there is a volcano there. They are not really aware. This is the problem of calderas, that they don't look like volcanoes. There is in the middle of the town, somewhere here, you see this uh, uh, white stain? It's a solfatara. It's a place where there is a lot of sulfur. So if you are there, you smell it, and you think you are on a volcano. But if you are elsewhere in the, in the volcano, you don't see much. So this is one thing people didn't know when they went there. And actually, even for scientists, it took many, many years to realize that this volcano was so dangerous. And I think uh, it was until maybe, maybe in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 80s, that it was becoming clearer and clearer that the volcano was super dangerous. But uh, the houses were all there already. They kind of knew, I mean, <laughs> we knew already that there was, uh, uh, but not as clear as we know now. Okay, okay. So um, another component, so is if you see it, uh, is the first component. And the second is how long ago the eruption has, has occurred. Because if the eruption has occurred 10 years ago, everybody knows. And they will not rebuild the house uh, right on top. Yeah. But if the eruption has occurred many generations ago, then people will not remember very easily. Uh, and they will say, okay, the volcano is, uh, is extinct. Yeah, and I, Dormant, I, but actually for a volcano, 500 years is nothing, you know? Yeah, yes. So um, since um, they don't know, and maybe it has taken a longer time. Yeah. I don't know the time, the exact time if the event happened over there. But since um, even we can't, they can't recall the time, and I don't know, it could be that it can happen maybe um, like in the near future, not very long, because it has happened for a very long time. Yeah, so um, we are still, uh, it's not, uh, we are still, what you are asking now is whether we know the how we can forecast the time of a new eruption even based on recurrent time or something like this yeah um, it's not really clear because the volcanoes they don't occur you know with uh, very regular times and uh, it's not uh, even clear it's not clear we don't know how long we have from the first signs that something is really on the move to eruption, we don't know. Okay. You know, we don't know whether it's going to be three days or whether it's going to be a month that we have time to evacuate the people. There are evacuation plans, but you, you can see uh, that this is a lot of people. I mean, you yeah. really have to displace. This is a town with uh, 600,000 people. It's not something that you evacuate very quickly and there are, hospitals, there are, you know, all sorts of things. And uh, even the roads are very chaotic. You see how chaotic it is due to the topography. So all the questions that you are asking are very important. And in the course, we will do like this. So like today, I will just do this super introductory. Okay. Then we will go to the physical properties of magmas and so on. Then we will go to the observatory. We will look at the seismicity, the earthquakes, the moment tensor, the locations, uh, and uh, especially when you have magma on the move. Then we will go to the formation, crustal deformation, and how you model the swelling and the displacements, ground displacements of the magma. Then we will look a little bit to lava flows and how to forecast lava flows and the other um, flow of magma. And in the end, we will look 
<coughs> at the probability of having their options and also how they interact with the earthquakes. Okay. So this will be the plan, more or less. Okay. At the end, I hope you will have uh, a clearer picture of all this stuff. So now we were here. So we go. Okay, then there is this, this one is uh, Krakatau in Indonesia is a volcano that collapsed two years ago, three years ago. The flank you see was the, now, this is seen from the satellite. It has a weird view, you know, the volcano is all uh, squeezed on one side, but this is the summit. And then the next slide, the next image, there is a hole here. You see the volcano collapsed and there was a tsunami and a lot of victims. And here you can see the collapsed cone, how big it was from and the submarine. So this is another process that is very dangerous and is very hard to forecast. But maybe in this in a paper, they showed that there was a very slow movement anticipating the big collapse. So we need to monitor this, these volcanoes very, very carefully. Uh, and then I wanted to show you this is a, a volcano in Africa, Oldonio Lengai. I think it is. Uh, is it in Kenya? Is it Tanzania? I can't remember even. It is in volcanoes. I wanted. Oh no, I wanted to show you. Uh, this eruption. It's uh, very weird. You see, <laughs> this is lava. And it is this. Uh, it is uh, this color, black. It becomes white when it is uh, dry. Uh, and the super super spot. There are very few volcanoes in the world that are like this. And the, it's very weird lava. You see, it's um, so special because it's uh, it's called the carbonata. Instead of having only silica, it has uh, carbon in the, in the rock composition. And it is a rare, very rare volcano. That there are very few extinct ones and the active, this active, I think only this Oldonio Lengai um, in the East African Rift. Very, very special volcano, yeah. So just to show you that there are different, different types of volcanoes. So this is a kind of a summary here, also for the eruptive style. You see when there is a connection between eruptive style and shape of the volcano. So when where you have this Icelandic eruption style, you don't even have the volcano very often. You just have like a, a flat ground and you have these fissures that simply split um, the crust, if you have, because Iceland is at the mid ocean ridge, it's a little piece of continent on the mid ocean ridge, and you have a crustal splitting, and this is how it occurs. We will talk about this crustal splitting as well. We will also talk a lot about the um, events that occurred in Iceland about crustal splitting and also in Ethiopia. Then we had a look at Hawaiian. So, Hawaiian here in the figure, it looks like a lava lake at the summit with a big um, tube actually below the earth it doesn't look like this this is a bit of an old view and uh, i showed you that also why uh, erupts as a fissure so you still have this uh, blade like magmas to create a fissure then you have um, other shapes strombolian is when you have um, small eruptions that are um, explosions, but they are small, very small. You can even sit and uh, have a look almost. And then others that are much more dangerous. Vulcanian, Pelean, when you have like at the side, and Plinian is the super big when you have also the umbrella um, entering into layers of the atmosphere where actually the cloud is spreading sideways rather than going vertically up. So this is um, a summary of the eruption style. Here we have uh, some more footage. This video I will show you to you actually, I think uh, the next time 
because it's a bit long, but it is a cool video. This day in Pompeii video and also the 94 eruption. We will see it another day. Okay, so we can talk a little bit more on the on these lava domes. I'll show you some figures of lava domes. There are different types of lava domes. Sometimes they are flat topped and circular. Um, and sometimes they, they really, uh, you saw there was a footage where this kind of spine, they are called spine when they grow like this, the volcano, the conduit pushes up the lavas vertically and they are so viscous that they look like a block. The temperature is very high, so don't be fooled. This is not cold, it's still, you know, 600 degrees, something like this, but they are so viscous. Uh, and there is, uh, this is a very sweet thing. There was this Japanese guy, he was called Masao Momatsu, and he was uh, actually a, a post guide. Uh, he was a mailman and he, he, had, uh, he could see the volcano from his window and he started, the volcano was flat, there was nothing. And then the, the volcano started to swell. It was actually a dome that was forming slowly, slowly. And he, on his window, started to draw all the uh, contours of the volcano. There are actually many more. He, he draw so many of these contours. Uh, so this was on 6 June in 44, 45, uh, and so on. <laughs> And this study that he did, I mean, it was simply just to take a record many, many years ago of this volcano. And this was one of the first study, even if it was from a normal person doing, you know, not a scientist, but the data were used later to study the volcano because it's a, a wonderful record. So this was a famous, a famous thing. Um, Okay, this, these are simply other types of lava domes. I'll show you the photos. So how the lava domes look? They look really like this, you know, you have the volcano and then at some point you see something like this. You see like a, a cake uh, uh, slowly, slowly forming at the top of the volcano. Sometimes they look more like a cake like this. Sometimes they look like a pile of rubble like this. Sometimes it, the surface is very rugged like this. Sometimes the surface is smoother. So they, they can be a bit different. Here is another movie. Uh, okay, sometimes there is a scar from a previous collapse and the dome forms within the scar. You see, so you are even, um, it can be that, you know, when the collapse occurs, then it will be down the same scar. Okay, so do you have other questions? Um, then I will talk about this next time, the hyaloclastite. Um, Maybe you can tell me, you guys, if you want, if you like, um, what you would like to do later. You know, if you would like to do a project in seismology or anything, because uh, for me it matters. Because when uh, I talk about this stuff, I I can make more comments if I know that it is relevant for you. You know, like link it better to what you want to do later. So if you. I will stop sharing. If you tell me briefly, it would be very good for me. Hello. Yes, you can start maybe. Yes. Um, um, are you asking us um, what we'll be doing for the diploma thesis or in the future, maybe after the diploma, what we want to Focus yeah, on. simply, do you have already, some students have already in mind what, um, what they want to do, like some students want to go to study hydro, like a geothermal research, some students they want to do seismology, some other students they want to do 
Some people know, some other people don't know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so well, if you know. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for me, for me, um, I'm interested in the seismology, maybe combining seismology and GPS time series to study um, the seismic and post-seismic deformation and this slow slip event at the subduction zones and the, okay. to know how this um, deformations influence um, the geodetic locking and possibly how the company could influence future uh, make mega trust earthquake that could hop okay at the subduction zone so like this is what and i think um at the subduction zones too we have volcanoes they really happen over there so i think i will really yes. benefit from this program okay then uh, um yes okay it's good to know very good to know yes um uh, from uh, for, for me it will be uh, seismology and also uh, the induced seismicity of uh, fracking okay of fractal mechanics also a little bit of rock mechanics and uh, combined with the seismology also this is uh, interesting and for you i can tell you already there are some topics that i will uh, deal with that are very relevant because mm. you saw this this blade like dikes this blade like magma this is yes. the same as fracking it's like fracking but pushed by a magma chamber you see that they are like big cracks with the with the magma going through and the um, uh, physics is the same so you have a, a fluid with very high pressure that needs to propagate and therefore what it does is to crack the rock and it oh, is okay. exactly the same just bigger <laughs> okay 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 yeah. so yeah. everything i will say about that is the same as for fracking okay okay great yeah Now, before I learn all your names, you need to go one after after the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am. Okay. So. Ah, innocent. You can talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Me, we have not yet selected the area and uh, the topic to work on, but as soon as uh, we select, we will let you know. Ah, okay. No, so you still have not decided. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, Dung. Dung, are you there? Yeah, yeah. So, Dung, did you decide already what project you want to do later, or are you still uh, uh, selecting? I'm um, still selected, also. Okay. Well, maybe later you tell me more, you know, what you are thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Kumsa. Yes. Hi Kumsa, yeah. you what what are you what is your plan? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm with Innocent actually. But okay. I, I'm th I'm thinking like you know in Ethiopia we have many like rifts or something. Yes. I hope I uh, I can do something near to that area. Like yeah, volcano. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yes, yeah. I know. I visited Addis once Ardi, for, yeah. <laughs> yes, for a conference <laughs> on volcanoes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very cool city. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And then is this the lady? Is gone already. I yeah, will ask them next I, time. Yeah, I think we are we are finished, right? Um yes. the, we, all of us have said it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so if we can know maybe um, what kind of project you've um, you've done maybe in the previous years and uh, it will be ah, yes, I can also talk about this. Yes, sure, that would be used. All right. Yes, yes, it will be yeah. interesting, and uh, also it will be maybe give us uh, more uh, more idea also for the future for developing ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I, I will try to do it. You know, it's like today, I just wanted to show you a lot of things. Okay. But in the, in the future, I will I will talk also about uh, like uh, I will explain a topic, and then I will explain what are the questions, what we understand already. And what we don't understand that needs to be investigated, for example. So you yes, you yes. have an overview of questions that people are thinking about. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Excellent. So uh, we tomorrow we don't have class, but Thursday. So I'll see you yes. on Thursday at, at two. Okay. Okay. Ciao. Okay. Bye. 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 Ciao. Bye. 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 Yo, bro, innocent. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Yes, Yakub. Yeah, I hope everyone is fine. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Actually, that, we are fine. Just that we are tired. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> you understand this point. Yes. <laughs> uh, Tarek, you connected to twice? What? I said you connected with two machines. Go. Yeah, yeah, because because I couldn't use my uh, couldn't yeah, use the microphone for the. Oh, okay, 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 cool. Yeah. It happened to me. Yeah, so I will leave you guys here yeah. and you know, connect. Okay. Yeah, then we will connect. Oh, cool. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Sorry. I said, take care, and we we'll see. We meet again on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, bye. 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 bye.